Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, our 11 a.m. Saturday morning panel. Thank you so much for joining us. We are excited to have a team of experts with us to talk about everything that's going on in the voting rights world, which is um, a lot. So I'm going to keep my <laughs> remarks up top very short um, so that we can dive right in. I want to get right to it and introduce our panelists. Um, all three are, are members in different forms um, of the All Voting as Local campaign, which is a national campaign that works with partners at the state and local level to ensure that access to the ballot is expanded and protected on all levels. Um, so I'm going to go alphabetically and let's start with uh, Rosemary Avila, who is the Arizona campaign manager for All Voting as Local, where she manages the development and implementation of their campaign in Arizona. She has more than 10 years of experience working with Native American communities. Prior to the campaign, um, Avila was a judicial clerk for the Manchatucket Pequot Tribal Court, where she is a tribal and appellate court judges in drafting legal decisions related to various areas of Indian law. Um, she holds her Juris Doctor from the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University, where she co-directed the Native Vote Election Protection Initiative in 2016. Jonathan Diaz is legal counsel at Campaign Legal Center, where his work focuses on overcoming barriers to accessing the ballot, including issues related to local election administration, the census, and the intersection of elections in the criminal justice system. He litigates voting rights cases in federal courts across the United States and advocates for laws and policies to expand access to the ballot. And Finally, we've got Aklima Kondoker, who is the Georgia State Director for All Voting as Local. Um, before joining All Voting as Local, Aklima worked as a staff attorney and senior manager for the Voting Access Project at the ACLU of Georgia. Um, in her voting work, she's done it all from litigation to advocacy to crafting policy and regulatory proposals. Um, she has her law degree from John Marshall Law School in Atlanta. And I've realized that I just jumped the gun entirely and blew past Natasha, which is totally my fault. Um, and so I want to kick it back to Natasha Martinez. And, and my apologies, Natasha, for just being so eager to dig right in. No, that's fine. I'm eager to dig right in too. So hello, my name is Natasha Martinez, a third year student at the University of Missouri School of Law. Um, since I turned 18, I spent many hours protecting the franchise. This year, that challenge was harder than ever before, but that challenge isn't new. It was just put into the spotlight. The mission of voter fraud and voter ID claims have always been about disenfranchising marginalized communities. Creating access to the ballot is important for the future of our democracy. This past year, we saw the crucial need for the same day voter registration, early voting, and fundamental need for voter accessibility. Over the summer, I interned with the ACLU Voting Rights Project, who fought over 26 lawsuits in the summer alone. We saw many of our current laws creating systems where voters were choosing between their own health in the middle of a pandemic and their right to vote. These individuals you're gonna hear from today know more than ever how important that fight was this summer and how important that fight will continue to be in the future. Just this week, actually. Um, but moving forward, our democracy was blatantly challenged in ways many of us will continually hope we can um, fix in the future. Many of us hoped we would never see what happened to us this week. We saw our democracy challenged over and over. So now it's imperative we all get on board to see, to continue this fight and see our country moving forward. Today's conversation will be about reviewing what's happened this past year, while also previewing the challenges we as a society will continue to face moving forward. So now Lindsay's introduced everyone else, um, but I get to introduce in Lindsay. Lindsay serves as the Director of Policy and Program for ACS. She leads the charge for the democracy and voting and equality and liberty portfolios of ACS. Lindsay works with legal scholars and advocates to protect and expand the right to vote. Before joining ACS, Lindsay directed voter protection programs on behalf of two presidential campaigns, a national party, and two state party organizations. Lindsay received her JD from Vanderbilt Law School and her Bachelor's of Arts from New York University. Without further ado, here's the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha, for, for setting us up so well and, and kind of setting the frame for us. Um, I want to turn to Rosemary first. 
and hoping that you can tell us a little bit about what you all saw out in Arizona in 2020 and what you're seeing kind of as the result of your really successful efforts. Yeah, excuse me. Thank you for the opportunity. Good morning, everybody. Um, at least it's morning here in Arizona. So um, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. Um, I just want to say that it's a great privilege to share this space with Aklima and Jonathan, who are colleagues that I have a lot of respect and admiration for. They do a lot of great work. So um, just happy to be here today. And um, I want to talk about what happened in Arizona in 2020 with a particular focus on uh, our, the native boat work that we were able to be a part of. Um, and so I'll start with a little bit of context for folks who may not be familiar with our state. We are home to 22 federally recognized tribes, about 27% of our land base, which is roughly almost 20 million acres, um, our tribal lands. And so when we take action to ensure equitable access to all aspects of the voting process, which is the core of the work that we do at All, Vo all Voting is Local, <clears throat> then we need to make sure that we keep the uniqueness of the circumstances that Native American voters face um, at the top of our mind, especially given the legacy of disenfranchisement that Native voters have faced, not just here in Arizona, but across this nation. Um, it's important for us to make sure that um, Native voices and Native votes are a part of the work that we do. And so here in Arizona, that is a big component of um, the, uh, the work that we did in 2020 and the work that we are going to continue to do moving forward. Um, <clears throat> we have the great privilege and the great fortune to be plugged into a number of uh, great coalitions here in the state that are comp comprised of both state, local, and national partners. Um, we um, are also part of a small but dedicated group of uh, a coalition that is uh, specifically works on native vote issues. And the two main entities that we work with are the Intertribal Council of Arizona, which is a nonprofit org that represents and has members, uh, 21 of the 22 member tribes um, are part of ITCA. And we also work with the Indian Legal Clinic um, out of Arizona State University Law School. And so what I wanted to do is talk just a little bit kind of sequentially about um, voter edge and then access to the ballot and the things that we did last year to ensure that native voters were able to um, participate in the electoral process. And, so starting with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the online voter registration work that we did um, in our coalition. Um, currently, our online voter registration system is operated through our motor vehicle division, and it's only available to folks who possess an Arizona driver's license or a non-operating um, identification. Um, before the work we started to do last year with our coalition of folks, um, the online registration system was also closed off to people who, did, who had non-standard addresses. So what this means is specifically here in Arizona, um, because of the vastness of the land base that we have that is in tribal communities um, and, and not just, and beyond, even beyond that, the rural communities that we have, there are a lot of folks who have non-standard addresses. And what this means is um, particularly say, for example, on the Navajo Nation, you go and somebody identifies that they're not gonna tell you my number, uh, my address is 123 Cherry Avenue. They're gonna tell you, uh, my address is five miles south of the chapter house um, above the, um, the trading post. And it'll be something that is descriptive rather than uh, have a numerical aspect to it. Um, there are a lot of people here in Arizona, particularly who live on tribal lands and on reservations who have non-standard addresses. And the problem here is that we found that when folks um, are able to register in person with using a paper form, you are able to write out a map of your, um, of your address. You're also able to use your tribal identification as a source of ID and as a source of establishing um, citizenship. However, on our online voter registration system, you are incapable of plugging those in to register to vote online. Why was this important last year? Well, we were in a pandemic and traditionally Native Americans register in person at in-person events in their communities. Um, flea markets, uh, cultural events, uh, at grocery stores, at powwows, whatever it may be. And obviously because of the pandemic and because of the disproportionate um, uh, ways in which native communities were hit with COVID, um, there was a time when the Navajo Nation and the White Mountain Apache tribe had the highest per capita uh, COVID rates in the nation. And so the disproportionate you know, nature in which they were hit by COVID foreclosed that option to register to vote. 
um, in person. And so we see about 32% of Native Americans who are eligible to vote um, are not registered to vote. Um, and that just increasingly went down last year. So it was a problem before the pandemic hit, um, but when the pandemic hit, uh, this problem with the online voter registration system was exacerbated. And so what we did was we um, came together and crafted a letter to the Secretary of State's office um, and asked that they um, try to create fixes um, to allow for native voters or rural voters who did not have standard addresses and folks who had tribal IDs but may have not possessed um, a state ID to be able to input this information into the online voter registration system so that they could become registered to vote. Um, the other option that folks had was um, they had to obtain the paper registration forms on their own, um, which was uh, an issue because you had to either call the Secretary of State's office and have it mailed to you or go in person or print it off. And we all know that that's not accessible for many people. Um, a lot of people don't have printers. Um, and then we add to the fact the undeliverable mail um, in our tribal communities. We have, I think, 96% of non-natives in Arizona live on a mail delivery route. Um, compared to, I think it's about 26% of native voters who live on a postal route. And when you go outside of Maricopa and Pima County, that number drastically falls to only 18% of native Americans who live on a reliable mail delivery route. So some of these options that we were being presented with just weren't viable for our native communities. And so um, one of the things that happened um, gratefully was the secretary of state was able to do an immediate fix to where the system is not perfect, but they were able to allow for folks to be able to put non-standard addresses into the online voter registration system. Um, there's still some work to be done around signature cap capturing and um, the ability to use tribal IDs in lieu of driver's licenses. Um, that's something that we are continuing to work on this cycle and into the future until it gets resolved. Um, but uh, that was an option that was at least <clears throat> partially resolved before the election. And then I just wanna briefly talk a little bit about um, our access to the ballot, uh, some of the educational campaigns that we do. All Voting is Local is an advocacy organization, but um, a lot of our advocacy has to incorporate, um, <clears throat> has to incorporate educa an educational component. Like we don't do um, voter registration drives. We don't do um, necessarily a lot of get out the vote stuff, but some of our educational components of getting out the vote um, have to be interwoven with our advocacy. And so in, here in Arizona, we have two indigenous languages, Apache and Navajo, that are covered under section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. They are language minorities. Um, and so there are several of our counties that are required to provide this information, any information that pertains to the electoral process in those two languages. <clears throat> so what we did here at All Voting is Local is we ran um, some public service announcements on tribal radio stations in several different languages. Um, we were able to run uh, several PSAs targeted at voter registration deadlines during the early voting process and during the election day um, to remind folks to get out, check their status, um, and to make a voting plan. We had those run in English, obviously, in Navajo, um, in Hopi, and in Spanish, the Pascoyaki tribe is a tribe that has that speaks um, that has Spanish and English language. So we were able to run those in all of those languages, which nobody else, um, you know, the media, the the market was saturated with a lot of folks trying to get their voting information out, but nobody was doing what we were doing. Nobody was offering it in those languages. Um, another thing that we did was we had two telephone town halls um, where we called landlines. And yes, I can confirm that people still have landlines today. Um, so um, we did one of them particularly focused for our Native American voters where we addressed some of the unique um, barriers that they face. And what we did there were, was we also were able to offer live translations of that telephone town hall in both Apache and Navajo, which is something that had never even been thought about um, to be done here. Um, you know. Ironically, even though we have such a high percentage of folks who do speak those languages and have limited English um, um, fluency in those communities. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is um, the Native Vote Hotline, um, which has been run out of the Indian Legal Clinic for um, many years now. Um, and we plug in and are part of the 866 Our Vote, which is run by the Lawyers Committee, but there's also a separate 
line specifically dedicated to our native voters. Um, it's a line that we mark that is marketed for native voters um, and the Indian Legal Clinic and the Intertribal Council of Arizona run that. Um, all voting is local supported in by providing um, translators for languages like Apache, Navajo, and Hopi. Uh, that's something that was never done before, was unable to be um, offered, but this election cycle and moving forward, we hope to expand that to some other um, tribal languages as well. So um, we were able to provide you know, assistance to tribes um, in that way and providing subgrants to some of these communities that we work with and some of these organizations. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, important it's important work for us to you know ensure that we are connected and plugged into these networks of native vote coalitions because historically native americans have faced many obstacles to access the voting process um, and i think if you fail to, under, to understand the realities and the historical experiences of a group of people then you're unable to identify the legacy of problems like disenfranchisement um, that were powered by essentially racist laws and policies um, at the federal, state, and local government levels. And, um, and you know, if you're unable to identify them, then ultimately you're, un then you can't um, even begin to properly address and rectify them. And so that's why it's important that when we are talking about accessibility of voting for Native American communities, we acknowledge that the current barriers don't exist as these standalone examples of disenfranchisement, um, but that they are, a part of a long string of problems that have closed off the franchise to Native Americans. And that's why the work that we are doing and conti will continue to do here in Arizona will always keep um, that community at the forefront. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Um, I wanna turn to Aklima next. Uh, I know everyone has Georgia on their mind based on the question queue that I'm seeing. And just a reminder that you can submit questions through the Whova app. Um, but Aklima, tell us what's, what you've been seeing over the last year in Georgia and, and what the latest is um, on the ground there. Sure, thank you. Happy to and happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us um, to join this wonderful convening. We're so excited to share um, useful and helpful information about what's happening stateside and what we could do as a nation to improve voting rights for everybody. So in the state of Georgia, I think it's no surprise that what we've seen publicized over the 2020 election is largely what everybody knows. We've seen long lines as a direct result of closures and consolidations, of shortage of poll workers. These are problems that are systemic that have been happening in Georgia for many, many years. And we've seen those closures and those long lines happening in predominantly black and brown communities. So because of that, our work really focused on making sure that more people of color could equitably and fairly access the ballot. So over 2020, a lot of these problems were mainly exacerbated because of the pandemic. Let's be clear that they weren't caused by the pandemic, which is something that we hear a lot of people say. Instead, we have institutionalized problems that make it very difficult for people to vote. And the pandemic merely highlighted those issues and became the catalyst for change. And one of the ways that we were able to bring about change is through our state election board. Our state election board had an emergency ru uh, rule to allow for drop boxes for the very first time in 2020. So when we at All Voting is Local heard about this change, we immediately pushed to have drop boxes added in more locations. So what are drop boxes? Drop boxes look a lot like mailboxes. Um, over 2020, they were stationed outside in locations for people to access them so that folks can safely and securely return their ballot drop boxes. This is important because it costs money to mail in your ballot. It costs money because you have to pay for a stamp, but it also costs your time in case you don't live near a, a, a mailbox, in case you don't live near a postal service. And one of the struggles that we had over 2020 as well is that the vendor that would send us our ballots here in the state of Georgia was actually in Arizona. And there were issues with the United States Postal Service getting us those ballots in on time. So then there was more time required um, for voters to then receive those ballots to send them back. So that means that the um, amount of time required over 2020 to receive your ballot, send it in on time, would be a barrier for people to access the ballot. Because if you don't get it in on time, if you don't receive it on time, you can't send it back on time and then your vote won't be counted. So a way to 
um, bypass that issue is to have drop boxes. But drop boxes, once you receive your ballot, you fill it out, you can just put it into that drop box. That's one-to-one -one communication with your county. Well, when All Voting is Local heard about this issue, we pushed to have more counties add drop boxes. And thankfully, we were able to add over 330 drop boxes statewide. And this was done in partnership with other people in state. So we worked very closely with other organizations such as Black Voters Matter, New Georgia Project, uh, Fair Fight, and other organizations who work towards progressive issues to make sure that more people can access the ballot. Another issue that we saw um, over 2020 is that a lot of people didn't have access to important information related to accessing the vote. So where I mentioned that there's this big issue with polling place closures and consolidations and people just not knowing where to cast their ballots, we were also able to get important information to allow for people to have expanded access to the ballot. There was no way for people to figure out where their drop box was even located, whether they even had a drop box in their community. So with our fabulous uh, data team here at All Voting is Local, we were able to come up with a uh, data or rather a drop box map to show everybody where their drop box location is so they know exactly where it is they need to go to provide their ballot in on time so that way they wouldn't have any lateness that would result in a rejection of their ballot. This was important because unfortunately the state of Georgia did not provide this option to voters. So a lot of voters didn't even know they had a drop box available to them. Another way that we were able to help with critical information that people didn't have is that the state of Georgia also does not provide in-language material to all voters. We have 159 counties in the state of Georgia. They all use, they all operate independently of one another when conducting their elections. So that means that it's really up to a particular county what voting materials they want to make available. Now, to be clear, there is federal law that has certain requirements, but usually counties just follow the bare minimum. They, they don't rise to the occasion to allow for more comprehensive guidance for counties. But we were able to work with one county in particular, DeKalb County, that has a very robust API and Spanish-speaking community, and we were able to get DeKalb County to provide in-language materials to those communities so those folks would know what is at stake, how to register, how to get your ballot in on time, all of that important information to assure that these people can access the ballot um, e equitably. And speaking of equitable ballot access, one of the things we have been focused on is making sure that voters with disabilities can actually equitably access the ballot. One of the major issues that caused a lot of the long lines that the nation saw in Georgia was the introduction of these new Dominion voting machines. These voting machines are, are, are very big, they're very hefty, and unfortunately Georgia did not have a long time to preview these machines. I believe that the state of Colorado um, when they were testing these machines, they did the testing over a number of years, I believe two years. In Georgia, we only tested for a couple of months or a number of months prior to our 2020 election, previewed them for the first time during that 2020 election, when the pandemic exacerbated issues that were already longstanding in our state. So that means there was, there was a tremendous room for error in Georgia. And one of the things that I think has gone overlooked is when you use the Dominion machine, it prints out a paper ballot with a QR code and tiny text for the voter to review to then verify that the, their selections are actually correctly represented. They then take that paper ballot, put it through a scanner, the scanner reads it, and then, and then uh, uh, collects that vote, adds that vote. So what would happen if you are blind or sight limited is you cannot see that. You don't have a way to independently or privately review your ballot. This is a problem. Well, this is an issue that um, I had previously worked on when I was at the ACLU of Georgia that I continued to work on when I joined the All Voting is Local team because we knew that it was incredibly important for all communities to be able to privately and independently review their ballots. We pushed the Secretary of State's office to allow for scanners or at least allow for an independent way for people to review their ballots. Unfortunately, this was an issue that the Secretary of State's office did not prioritize. So while we received an assurance that there would be scanners at these sites, there were no scanners at these sites. Instead, what we were able to get 
is permission for people to use a scanner app on their cell phone in order for them to read their ballot so that way they can read their ballot independently. While this was um, a somewhat positive short-term solution, we understand that this does not address this long-term problem of not everyone having access to smartphone technology or being able to do this themselves. So this is still an ongoing issue that we are monitoring and working on so that we can continue to make sure that people can independently review their ballots. Unfortunately, this is an issue that does not have a robust solution now, but thankfully, this is something that we are able to get more disability rights advocates to speak out against and to work towards. And we are hopeful that we can see some positive change happening sometime this year. Um, another issue that we worked on, as I mentioned, we had a lot of closures and consolidations happening without notice. We saw this happen in uh, predominantly black and brown communities, especially communities like Hall County, where they have a very robust Hispanic community, have seen a lot of early vote location closing um, in their communities to make it difficult for folks to access the ballot. We've seen the same thing in Cobb County. Well, we, along with our partners, were able to push to make sure that we had early vote sites that were previously closed for reasons such as not having enough staff or not having enough resources. We were able to push for them to add early vote sites so that way we can help members of the community who do not have a way to access the ballot during early voting to, act, to actually have a location for them to vote. So we were able to provide for drop boxes. So that way, if you're a person who maybe can't vote during early vote hours because you work, because you have other obligations, because you don't have an early vote center near you, site near you rather, you can use that drop box to safely and securely return your ballot to get your vote in so your vote can actually count. If you are someone who prefers to use an early vote location because that is your preference and that is your right to have all options available to you to vote, we were also able to push to have more early vote locations in critical communities, critical black and brown communities where they have experienced the most closures and consolidations. We were able to add more sites in those critical communities. We we're also able to push to have um, in language materials uh, available to AAPI and Spanish speaking voters because if you don't understand what's on your ballot, if you don't understand the voting process, you cannot fully participate within that process. Um, another way that we help um, over the primaries is, I mentioned long lines, closures, consolidations, those things that we've seen, but those long lines are extreme in black and brown communities. Rosemary had mentioned our partnerships with Lawyers Committee and the Election Protection Program. What the Election Protection Program does, it allows for people to call into a hotline to talk about any to to uh, talk about any issues that they're seeing at locations, if they're seeing discrimination, if they're seeing intimidation, if they're seeing any issues that would make it difficult for people to cast their ballots, they can call into that hotline. It's a nonpartisan hotline. It's a team of lawyers who are there to answer your call, answer questions, and also, if necessary, file paperwork with the court to make sure that people's right to vote are not um, are, are not halted or, or stopped by any sort of issues happening at that polling site. Well, during early voting, one of the things that we saw happening is that many of our sites were opening late, um, not, not allowing for people to stay in line for the uh, entirety of the time that the site, site is open, thereby shortening the amount of time that a person has to vote. Let me make this make this a, a point for folks to see in, in real time. So if you're waiting in line for five hours, that site closes at 7 p.m., it is now 6.50, you are still 30th in line. If they close down that location, those five hours are now gone. You've lost them. And you've also lost a meaningful opportunity to vote because within those 10 minutes, you're not holding out hope that you're gonna make it to the front of that line. So through, through the Election Protection Coalition, we received information that there were several sites in black and brown communities in Georgia where they were going to close down at about 7 p.m., not allowing people who have been waiting in those lines an opportunity to cast their ballots. So we were able to get those locations, court paperwork filed by lawyers committee to tell them that they must remain open to allow for anybody who's already standing in that line to actually vote. The issues that we saw there, and, and by the way, I was one of those lawyers who went down to a number of those locations with that paperwork in hand, telling those supervisors to please stay open to allow folks to vote. Um, at one of the locations that I had visited, where I had been on scene at 9 p.m., and I had been on the scene until about 2 a.m., 
um, we had police officers show up telling us, uh, like lawyers who were there to make sure that the site remained open and, and other um, nonpartisan, nonprofit organizations who were there doing line warming. In other words, handing out water and snacks to people to encourage them to stay in line. Um, we were told by the police that we needed to leave. And now we were told this at about um, 1 a.m. or so, while people were inside of the building now, no more outside, but inside casting their ballots. Now, we had to maintain our position there with other people from New Georgia Project, Black Voters Matter, um, ACLU of Georgia, and other people. We had to stand there and stand down the police to make sure that they weren't intimidating those voters, to assure that those voters could continue to enjoy their fundamental right to vote. That is also a part of our work to make sure that we are um, doing effective partnerships with the people that we are in coalition with to ensure that everybody can enjoy access to the ballot. Now, on some of the developments in Georgia, looking back at all of those issues. Now, I, I have said this a number of times that the pandemic only exacerbated long, longstanding problems. These issues, again, are not a product of the pandemic. They only make those issues um, more outstanding and I highlight them for us. So what has recently happened in Georgia is the passage of a harmful anti-voter bill, SB 202, now is going to be codified officially into law on July 1st. Um, what that bill does is it restricts access to the ballot across all of those points that I had mentioned, all of those improvements that I had mentioned that we worked on over 2020. Let's start with drop boxes. We had recommended at least one drop box for every 15 to 20,000 voters um, across the state. The reason why this is so important is number one, this is based on data and research. These are based on EAC recommendations to allow for more people to have effective ballot access. Unfortunately, what 202 will do is roll that back to be one ballot drop box for every 100,000 voters or a ballot drop box for every early vote site in that particular county, whichever is less. Specifically, the language is limiting the amount of drop boxes their county may have. So other than the fact that this will disenfranchise so many communities, particularly black and brown communities, where they have lost more early vote sites than any other community, we know that counties have spent a lot of money to get these ballot drop boxes. Uh, statewide, it's over $600,000 spent that is now lost with this, leg with, leg with this legislation. We also know that private funding is not allowed in this legislation. So where the nation saw millions of dollars pouring into Georgia to help support our elections, now that option is no longer available to counties. So 202, will harm both counties who are responsible, all 159 counties are responsible for their own election administration. It will make it more difficult for them to conduct their elections because it costs them money, money that they'll never get back and they can't even get private funding to help them with their elections. But also for our voters, our black and brown voters, they will now have less ballot access because they will have less access to those drop boxes. And on the point of how this will harm um, voters with disabilities, people who are immune compromised, well, those drop boxes, as previously discussed, they were allowed outside the way a traditional mailbox is allowed. A traditional mailbox is bolted to the ground. We know that you have easy access to one. You can just walk up to one, put your piece of mail in there. You know that it's protected. You know that a mail carrier is going to take it out. You know that your parcel is going to get to where it needs to be. That is how Dropbox has functioned, except they were even more safe because they were under 24-7 video surveillance. And the way that the emergency rule was written last year is that you can have a deer camera up to monitor that Dropbox. So it's like $75. It's cost effective. It works. So now under 202, those drop boxes are going to be forced inside of an early vote site, point blank period. So that means that if an early vote site has hours between nine to five only, those limited hours, those are the only hours in which a person can access that ballot drop box. Well, we are still in a pandemic. 
if you are a person who is of limited mobility and you cannot find your way into a voting site, or if you are someone who is immune compromised, who doesn't feel safe going inside of a voting site, you previously had the comfort of knowing you could use that outdoor drop box. Now that it's been taken away because they've been shoved inside of an early vote site. Now forcing you to find the time and ability to enter that site. If you are just a regular working person who works a job between the hours of nine to five, you now have to choose between going to your job, providing your, for your family or um, family obligations and your fundamental right to vote. You have to select which one is most important that day to determine your level of access. That is a false choice. That is not only a false choice, it's a horrific choice for voters to have to make. And so there, 202 presents tremendous problems on the order of drop boxes, but, but not just drop boxes. It also targets particular communities, and I'm happy to get into this some more, but I do not want to uh, monopolize this time. But let me just say this, what, what 202 also does is it makes it difficult for people to even um, request their absentee ballots. One of the things that we saw over 2020 is our Secretary of State sent all active voters an absentee ballot application because Secretary of State Raffensperger understood the need for voters to have this additional choice now that the pandemic has made it more difficult for people to access the ballot by exacerbating these issues that we already had. Well, now 202 says, well, if you don't request your ballot, no one's going to send your ballot. No one's going to uh, send your ballot application, rather. So they're making it more difficult for you to even receive your absentee ballot application, but they also shorten the amount of time in which you can even request your absentee ballot application, going from 180 days before an election to now about 78 days before an election, giving you less time to receive, to, to send in that application, to receive that application, to get your ballot, to then send that ballot out. So what I'm getting at is, for working people, for people who don't have access to critical election information, that the collection of those communities that I discussed, it is now more difficult for you to understand how to request your ballot, to have the time to request it, and then to send it back, and also on the order of it being difficult to request your ballot, identification requirements. These are things that we understand from Jim Crow policies as deliberate to keep Black folks out of the ballot box. Now, if you have a driver's license or a state ID, you can place that information on your ballot application. It's going to be easier for you to request your ballot. However, if you are someone who doesn't have that, someone who perhaps is an immigrant voter who has a passport, someone who perhaps is a rural voter or, or lives somewhere where they do not have access to driving a car, who doesn't have a driver's license, whoever you might be, you now have to have a photocopy to even request your ballot. So you need to have the resources to provide that copy. And if not a photocopy, then a scanned copy. You still need to have resources, resources to broadband inter internet, resources to smartphone technology in order to send that electronically, just to have an opportunity to get your ballot so that you can vote absentee. Something that has never been required in the state of Georgia since we've had no excuse absentee voting in, since, since 2005. So there are a lot of issues with um, SB202 and its passage, and I'm happy to answer questions here and expound on this point some more. But let me just close myself out by saying that um, what all voting is local endeavors to do is to provide comprehensive election, election administration reform at the county level. We have 159 counties in Georgia. That's over 159 ways that our elections can be messed up can be more difficult for people to access the ballot. And we focus in on communities that are historically marginalized and disenfranchised by uh, failure of election administration. We do that through advocacy. We do, we do that through supporting our partners. And we do that through publicly speaking out against policies that harm our voters. And one thing that I cannot uh, stress enough is that SB202 in its recent passage only serves to harm voters, particularly those communities that we serve. Thank you so much, Aklima. I want to bring Jonathan in now. Um, what has Campaign Legal Center been seeing over the last year and, and what do you see going forward? Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. I, I first want to thank you and Natasha and the ACS team for bringing us all together um, to talk about this, this issue, which I know that Aklima and Rosemary and I spend all day every day thinking about. 
Um, and so at CLC, we are, um, you know, we are based in Washington, DC, um, and our work has a national scope. So we are looking at these issues in, you know, all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Um, and so the kind of laundry list of, you know, barriers to accessing the ballot that Rosemary and Aklima described in Arizona and in Georgia are just two examples of what is really a nationwide effort to make voting harder um, for particularly for marginalized communities, for communities of color, rural voters, native voters. Um, but you know, it's it's reaching a level I think that is so egregious in some states that it's just harmful to everybody. Um, and you know, at CLC, we are you know we are a public interest legal organization. We rely really heavily on our local partners in the states to identify the kinds of election administration issues that pop up at the county and local level that you know are problems in and of themselves, but are also reflective of you know issues with statewide law um, or national trends that need to be addressed through policy advocacy and litigation. Um, so, you know, many of the issues that we have talked about already this morning are not just happening in competitive, you know, swing states like Arizona and Georgia. Um, the same issues that Rosemary described with, you know, non-traditional street addresses uh, among native voters in Arizona is something that we saw back in 2018 in North Dakota when we litigated a strict photo ID requirement that required, you know, voters to have an ID that listed their residential street address on it when many native voters in you know, the Standing Rock uh, tribal area, for example, don't have traditional residential street addresses. Um, and you know, the issues surrounding drop boxes and mail-in voting that were exacerbated by the pandemic um, you know, affected voters nationwide. Um, we litigated issues related to uh, signature match policies that resulted in the erroneous deprivation of voting rights for people with disabilities in states that you know you don't expect people that people don't necessarily think of when they think of you know states with bad election administration but we sued new york and new jersey because they were rejecting extraordinary numbers of absentee ballots on the basis of a signature mismatch without giving voters a chance to well first of all without even notifying them that their ballots might be rejected and without giving them a chance to come in and verify their identity um you know we filed a lawsuit in minnesota which has one of the most burdensome witness signature requirements for absentee ballots. During the height of the pandemic, um, Minnesota was requiring all of its voters who, were, who chose to vote by mail or to vote absentee to keep themselves safe uh, to get the signature of a witness. And that witness had to be another registered Minnesota voter. So if you are a college student attending school out of state, but you are registered at home in Minnesota, you had to find another Minnesotan at your school in New York or Texas or Florida uh, to witness your absentee ballot. If you were an elderly voter with health complications who lived alone, you had to risk exposure to COVID during the height of the pandemic to be able to vote in the, in the primary. Um, if you are like one of our clients, uh, a member of a mixed citizenship, citizenship status household, and you are the only American citizen in your home, um, you know, your, your spouse, um, may not be able to witness your ballot because of these requirements. And it's these kinds of burdens that have always existed, um, but were really thrown into the spotlight by the COVID pandemic. Um, and you would think that after this past year, um, with an election that was you know, hotly contested, um, that saw record levels of turnout despite the difficulties of the pandemic, that legislators and election officials would realize that what we need is more options, not less. Um, because we never know when the next, you know, major catastrophe is gonna coincide with a national election. And maybe it won't be a once in a century pandemic, maybe it'll be smaller scale. Um, but, you know, I am a Florida native and elections are right at the tail end of hurricane season. Um, and, you know, hurricanes hit Florida and Louisiana and Texas all the time and voters need to have the flexibility to make sure that they don't need to choose between their safety and their you know, fundamental right to vote. And so what we have done at CLC is in partnership with local advocates, like our friends at All Voting is Local, um, we have filed you know, tons of litigation over not just the course of the past year, but even earlier than that, um, to address these barriers to ballot access. 
um, and to make sure that states are complying with their obligations under the Constitution um, and federal voting law to make sure that voters' rights are protected. Um, and that starts, you know, it goes, you know, to making sure that voters' ballots are being counted, like like I discussed in the signature match context, but also, you know, it's as it's as basic as who is eligible to vote. Um, one of the areas that we do a lot of work in is in the felony disenfranchisement context, um, where we have litigated cases, uh, you know, the recent big litigation in Florida following the passage of Amendment 4, which we worked on with the ACLU and LDF and the Brennan Center and a whole bunch of other partners in Florida, um, you know, where the Florida legislature, after a historic referendum vote where, you know, more than almost two thirds of Florida citizens voted to restore voting rights uh, to their fellow Floridians uh, once they completed their felony sentences, the Florida legislature threw, you know, a bunch of hurdles up and said, okay, well, if, you know, you get your voting rights back when you finish your sentence, finishing your sentence means paying off all of the financial costs of your prosecution, fines, fees, restitution, court costs, probation costs, um, you know, amounts of money that are staggering to think about even before you factor in the fact that some of these folks have, you know, a really hard time even feeding themselves because they have a hard time finding employment after, you know, returning uh, from prison um, or, you know, obtaining health care. Um, and so it really is putting an exorbitant price tag on democracy. Um, and our lawsuit, although we were ultimately unsuccessful um, after an en banc 11th Circuit decision that went straight down party lines, um, you know, our lawsuit revealed fundamental flaws in Florida's system of even administering this terrible policy where the state couldn't even tell, you know, our 15 clients how much any, and you know any one of them owed, um, and so you know it led to I think some really important administrative reforms at the county level with the clerks cleaning up some of their records to make it easier for folks to even figure out how much they have to pay to vote, which is a phrase I can't say, believe I'm saying in 2021. Um, and you know it's those kinds of issues are not just limited to states in the deep south. Not, in, not It's not just Florida and Alabama and Georgia where we are litigating these issues. Um, and so at CLC, we launched um, an online, it's a web tool, an initiative called restoreyourvote.org, um, where voters in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico can you know, look up based on their you know, anonymized personal information, whether they are eligible to vote in their jurisdiction based on their felony conviction status and how long it's been and what the terms of rights restoration are in their states and if they have to take any additional steps to figure that out. Um, and that, um, that site, that tool saw huge spikes in activity over the course of 2020, um, which I think were reflective of just the enormous interest um, and attention being paid to what I, what I think most people would have considered a couple of years ago, the minutia of election administration and the machinery of you know, how to make sure that you are registered to vote, that you know where to go to vote, that you know how to request your ballot, how to cast your ballot, how to make sure your ballot is counted. Um, and you know, in the wake of the 2020 election, when we saw you know, more than 60 lawsuits filed by former President Trump and his allies um, seeking to overturn election results or to have results deemed, you know, to, to decertify results um, or to change the outcome, on the basis of you know, rules that they didn't like um, or you know, emergency provisions instated to address uh, the extra strain in our election system faced by the pandemic, um, you, know, it's, you can draw a very clear line, I think, between those sorts of anti-democratic efforts in the courtroom to the you know, horrible violent insurrection on January 6th to what we're seeing now in state legislatures where you know, in legislative sessions across the country, bills are being introduced at historic rates to restrict access to the ballot. It's not just SB 202 in Georgia, which you know, in addition to you know, making line warming a crime and limiting access to drop boxes and making it harder to vote absentee, also gives uh, the General Assembly and the State Election Board the power to take over 
county election administration if the counties are doing things they don't like, like making it easier for people to vote. Um, that is consistent with efforts that we have seen you know, across the country by self-interested politicians to you know, amass as much control over elections as they can in an effort to retain power, and in doing so, undermining the fundamental principles of our democracy. Um, you know, and denying the will of American voters and voters in their respective states, um, who I think overwhelmingly reject restrictions on the ballot. Um, you know, there this is a nationwide problem. It's not just in states that are competitive at the presidential and Senate level. You know, states like Florida, like Iowa, like uh, Montana, like West Virginia, states that we don't typically think of as being, you know, the hotbeds of, you know, where elections are competitive and where the parties are really fighting it out. Um, you know, state legislatures are still taking steps to restrict access to the ballot, to remove things, to get rid of things like automatic voter registration. Um, and same day registration, things that actually make voter rolls more secure um, and more accurate. Um, it's a nationwide problem. And you know, that's why I am, I think, so encouraged by the fact that we are really having a fulsome debate about nationwide solutions and things like the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, um, which I think we can talk about in more detail later on. Um, but you know, it's it's this kind of widespread coordinated effort to limit access to the ballot, particularly among communities of color um, and you know other marginalized communities that is you know that demands a, a nationwide solution um, because access to the ballot shouldn't depend on what state you live in um, or you know what party your election administrator is in your county or in your state. Um, and so the work that we are doing now at CLC is really focused on, um, both pushing back against negative legislative uh, proposals um, and giving advocates on the ground the legal background and the support that they need to show up at the state house and you know call out legislators who if they're not, if they're at least, if they're not going to listen to to reason if they're not going to listen to the facts about the you know that there is no widespread voter fraud to justify these restrictions um, if they're not going to listen to the facts that you know, these restrictions will disproportionately harm voters with disabilities and native voters and voters of color, um, then, you know, we're going to make sure that our partners on the ground have the tools to make sure that the public listens to that. Um, because these are really, this is the fundamental civil rights issue, I think, of, of our time, because there is, there is no other issue, there is no other topic that is even possible to, to discuss, to debate, to, to make progress on, unless the the bones of our democracy are, are strengthened. And so we are helping our state and local partners to fight back against negative laws. Um, we are promoting and supporting uh, those, those states that are instituting positive change. Um, you know, there are states like Washington uh, and like Oregon that are making a lot of really meaningful, powerful changes in the felony disenfranchisement context. Um, you know, Kentucky, I think has provided a maybe somewhat surprising bipartisan uh, model of cooperation on election administration issues. Um, you know, where their Republican Secretary of State and Democratic Governor came together to put together a legislative proposal that does expand access to the ballot for all Kentucky voters. Um, I would love to see more of that at the state level. Um, and then, you know, supporting federal efforts and really doing our part to demystify and correct some of the false narratives being thrown around about things like the like the For the People Act um, and like the the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, you know, the provisions of, of HR1, S1, the For the People Act, um, you know, they they have bipartisan origins. These are best practices that have been taken from red states, blue states, and purple states because they work. And they, you know, are, they exist right now in a patchwork where you know automatic voter registration exists in you know about half, a little bit more than half of of the states, um, and there's no reason for it not to in all of them. Um, there are still, I think, seven or eight states that don't have no excuse absentee voting. Um, so if you live in Texas or if you live in Tennessee, 
you need a specific statutory excuse um, to, to vote by mail, um, one of which is being a voter over 65. And that's great for voters over 65. Um, but those voters, those demographics, especially in those two states, Tennessee and Texas, um, you know, elderly voters tend to trend overwhelmingly white. Um, the Latino population in Texas um, is much younger than the population at large. And so this age restriction on absentee voting actually has a pretty strong disproportionate racial impact. And so, you know, there have been claims made by some senators on the Hill that this bill is nothing more than an attempt to you know, secure a permanent Democratic majority in the Senate um, or at the presidential level. And to that, I would say, you know, Utah has universal vote by mail. And, you know, I think we can all agree that Utah is still pretty red. Uh, Mike Lee and Mitt Romney got elected in a universal vote by mail state. So it's not about, you know, this idea that increased voter turnout, uh, increased civic engagement with our elections is something that should be manipulated for partisan gain um, is, you know, obviously antithetical to the principles of our democracy, but also I think it's factually wrong. Um, and we shouldn't be thinking about, you know, who is this going to, is this going to benefit Democrats or Republicans? Is this going to help, you know, my preferred politician or yours? Um, it's about the health of our democracy and making sure that, you know, we are not gaming the refs and skewing the playing field um, by denying people their fundamental constitutional rights. Thank you so much. I know we have just, we could talk about this for I think the entire rest of the day. Um, and sometimes we get the privilege to do so, but we've got four minutes left. I wanted to give everybody one quick opportunity um, to respond to what I think is really a theme of a lot of the questions that we've gotten on the uh, Whova app, which is, you know, given what feels pretty dire, um, where is one area of focus the students can really put their efforts? Is it at the local level? Is it advocating for federal legislation? What, what do you think is one particularly effective way for folks to kind of direct their, their energy and their time if they want to help? I can start by saying that, you know, I think that's a great question. I, I think that um, the local level is what All Voting is Local we are committed to doing. And I would just say, um, you know, with all the talk of HR1, um, you know, as this, you know, comprehensive reform package for democracy, and it is, it's, it's an, an incredible, it's an incredible sweeping reform package that we need. But I think it's important for us to note that HR1 establishes a baseline for voting rights. Um, it's a, it seems radical in the sense that there are so many states who don't have these common sense best practices already in place. And so in that sense, it does seem radical um, for states who wear voter suppression and um, you know, suppressing the vote is commonplace and the norm. Um, HR1 is very radical because it requires them to have the bare minimum, these bare minimum standards in place. Um, but what I would argue is that um, states should use HR1 and folks who are in these states should use HR1 as a catalyst to pressure their states to enact broader protections that go beyond the standards that are set forth in HR1, um, because there's still so much more that can be done. Um, there are a lot of things in HR1 that some states do already that Arizona, you know, as much as this legislative session, we've seen a lot of anti-voting bills come out of our legislative session, um, but there are some things in place that Arizona has that go beyond what HR1 has. There are a lot of things that we don't, that we need to, um, get on board with, but I would say um, the local level, um, getting involved, um, you know, putting into coalitions, um, getting involved um, in the legislature to the extent that you're able to um, is really uh, probably has more, uh, you know, long-term effects in terms of um, trying to revamp the vote, lo your local voting systems. Um, the counties at the county level is something that um, is of great importance here for us in Arizona. Least. And I misread yeah. the clock. We have 15 minutes. So feel free to take more than <laughs> the 30 seconds to answer Jonathan and Aquina. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I would I would just sort of to build on, on what Rosemary said. Um, you know, I think that especially uh, after the the Georgia runoffs, um, I saw a lot of people in my you know social media timelines and whatnot saying that, you know, oh, you know, 
look at look at how Georgia, you know, overcame these barriers and turned out all of these people, and look how high turnout was in the runoffs. We need to clone Stacey Abrams, and you know, every state, every county already has a Stacey Abrams, and if it doesn't, that could be you. You know, it's your wherever you live, your county board of elections or election supervisor or whatever your local jurisdiction's elections officer is holds public meetings. Go to those meetings, um, and you know, make it clear to the people who run elections in your jurisdiction that you care about this and that you know that expanding election access is important. Um, I think the thing that the biggest thing that I have learned since I started doing this work a few years ago is that you know there is no off cycle there is the the idea that you know the election cycle ends and then comes back is is just wrong elections are happening all the time um you know we may not be in the act of voting all the time um but you know right now in march after a presidential election year is when state legislatures are in session and are considering and in some cases passing legislation that will either expand or restrict the right to vote. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the people who are, who have a vested interest in restricting the right to vote are going to show up. Um, they are going to make sure that legislators hear what they have to say. Um, and so I think that it is incredibly important, especially for law students um, who have, I think, the a fluency with these issues that you know the average person may not just because it's you know it's something that you studied um, to really you know be a voice for your community and to you know advocate for you know for the people around you and to educate you know your family members your friends um, who may not be as plugged into you know these issues as you are. And I just want to add to what um, Rosemary and Jonathan have already said, because you're correct. At the local level, it's so very important to advocate for what your community needs. So to take what Jonathan said, um, what we do here in Georgia is we have a peanut gallery, which is a co coordinated effort um, with All Voting is Local, ACLU Georgia, and New Georgia Project that's actually had the training today, where we're training volunteers on how to have direct communication with your county election office, how to attend um, local board of election meetings. And then they publicly put the notes of that meeting online so that every single member of the community can access them. The reason why that's so important is because access to information gives you access to your vote. And so the more that you know what's happening at the county level, the more that you can inform yourself and inform those around you about what is necessary for you to effectively uh, cast your ballot and have it count. But also, that will also inform what sort of ballot expansion is needed for your community. So the way that we use that information collected from the peanut gallery is for election administration reform. Now, we don't just do that in, in a vacuum. We don't do that by ourselves. We do that with our partners. So as Rosemary and Jonathan said, certainly reach out to the organizations near you, the ones that you believe in, the ones that um, follow uh, progressive change specifically in elections and see how you can plug in and help. Volunteering is always necessary. Focusing in on what's happening at the county level is so very important. And it's so important in Georgia, especially because we have harmful litigation that takes power away from counties and how they're going to administer their elections. And the more people that we have on the ground who are willing to number one, learn about the issues and then understand the issues and then advocate for pro-voter policies the more people in your community will be able to vote. What we saw in 202 is a lot of targeted um, uh, policies that will make it more difficult for our Fulton County voters to cast their ballots. Now, on the topic of local elections, uh, Atlanta is in Fulton County, and they have a very important mayoral race that is happening in November. And so understanding that it's not just during a federal election, but these local elections really inform what your community is going to look like, the type of access that your neighbors are going to have, and the type of change that you can drive in your own backyard. So please pay attention to what's happening in your community. Sign up to volunteer. Folks love volunteering with students or working with folks who have an extensive legal background. That information is, is useful to so many communities. So please make your voice heard and please make sure that you support other organizations that are doing similar work. And on the topic of volunteering, I do just want to quickly plug, uh, Rosemary and Aklima did mention 
um, the Lawyers Committee's election protection hotline, um, which when voting does roll around, um, is always looking for volunteers for law students or lawyers. You don't have to, you know, do voting, uh, voting rights and election protection work for a living like we do all day, every day, um, you know, no matter what kind of law you practice. Um, you know, once you graduate and, and begin your careers, um, you know, legal volunteers are always welcome um, at, you know, the election protection hotline and other similar groups that are doing election protection work, you know, when, when voting comes around. Excellent plug. Um, I want to turn next to a couple of questions that we have about the Voting Rights Act. Um, and as, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, HR4 is one of the proposals that has been um, you know, floating around Congress and hopefully gaining some momentum. Um, the question is, would this, would the restoration of the Voting Rights Act in its full um, you know, capacity and form um, stop the changes that we're seeing in places like Arizona and in um, Georgia where we're seeing this you know, retrenchment of voting rights? So, so yes and no, um, you know, the, the, a restored Voting Rights Act would, would work in harmony with the federal protections in HR1 um, to address our existing barriers to voting and also prevent future ones. So the way that I like to think about it is, as, as Rosemary put it, um, you know, HR1 would establish a baseline um, that all states would need to meet right now. It would set minimum standards and it would supersede or invalidate a lot of the existing or proposed restrictions that we are seeing today. Um, so think of it as like medicine or treatment for our electoral system as it stands right now. What the voting rights reauthorization would do is it's more like a vaccine. Um, it would prevent future changes by subjecting certain covered jurisdictions to preclearance and requiring them to get pre-approval from the Justice Department or from a federal court um, to institute any voting change that would, you know, limit or restrict ballot access, especially for communities of color. Um, you know, that's the regime that we had for, you know, almost, I think, 50 years. Um, math is not my strong suit, so I went to law school. Um, but from the Voting Rights Act of 1965 until the Shelby County decision in 2013, um, preclearance was an extraordinarily powerful tool to prevent these things from taking place. Um, and so that's why we need a new VRA because HR1, as powerful and as, as radical of a change as it would bring to our election system, um, would only address the problems that we already face, that we currently face right now. Um, and so it really is, you know, work, would work hand in hand with a new Voting Rights Act um, to not only stop existing problems, but also prevent future ones. And I'd like to just add to that about HR4, the John Lewis Advancement Act, it adds the teeth back into uh, the Voting Rights Act. So what Jonathan had mentioned is that that preclearance requirement under Section 5 would require um, Southern states especially to make sure that they run first through the Department of Justice any changes that they're going to propose in a community to make sure that it doesn't disproportionately disenfranchise communities of color. It's meant to protect these communities so we can't see sweeping changes that will make it more difficult for people to access the ballot. What this looks like practically, for example, is in the state of Georgia, since Shelby v. Holder, that Supreme Court decision that we weakened the Voting Rights Act, we've seen over 200 polling place closures statewide happening predominantly in Black and Brown communities. So what the John Lewis Investment Act would do would add more power, add that power back into the Voting Rights Act so that states and counties, municipalities would have to go through the Department of Justice before making these sweeping changes that would harm these communities. So where legal challenges is certainly one way that people can combat voter suppression and make it possible for more people to access the ballot, it isn't the end all be all. Like, John, like, like Jonathan said, we need to have comprehensive reform at the county level so that way we, we can make sure that people have effective election administration so that folks have um, easier ways to access the ballot without restrictive barriers that make it more difficult for them to vote. But one mechanism that will help for sure is making sure that we have that um, codified in our laws 
so that way lawyers, when they need to litigate issues, they have the force of federal law behind them. And that truly makes a, different in in a difference in communities, particularly in communities of color, because we know that the Voting Rights Act is something that was able to see passage because of our, our wonderful civil rights leaders who, who, who walked, who marched, who sat, who bled to make sure that people had their fundamental right to vote. So that's why it's so important for us to continue to empower our federal legislation to help our states so that way more people can access the ballot. And Rosemary, I wanna give you a chance to jump in if you would like, but if not, I have a, a different question I'd love to direct your way. Um, so the question is, how does the right to vote get so deep into jeopardy? Um, the, the questioner asks, is it a situation where history is meant to repeat itself? But you, you spoke so eloquently earlier about the ways in which um, we, we need to respect the history of communities experiencing voter uh, suppression. And so I was hoping that you might might take a quick, uh, I know that this is a very big question, <laughs> um, but you know, how, how did we get here? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I mentioned earlier in talking about Native voters here in the context of Native voters that, you know, we can't, you know, talk about these barriers that, you know, as if they exist as standalone examples. It, it's part of a long string of history of disenfranchisement. And I think that, um, you know, what we're seeing happening now across our states um, during our legislative sessions with all these anti-democracy, anti-voting bills coming out. Um, is just a continuation of, um, you know, of this history that has remained and that, um, you know, people are adamant on continuing, you know, to try to disempower the communities who turned out and made their voices heard in 2020. It's a direct response to that. Um, folks don't like the fact that, you know, in Arizona, I think we saw from the 2016 presidential election to the 2020 election for Native voters, we saw about an eight, over eight percentage point in turnout for Native voters um, for our Latino voters here in Arizona. I think that was upwards of a five percent, a five percentage turnout um, rate that increased from the two, that, two, two, 2016 election to 2020. And so, you know, I think you know, um, what we're seeing is nothing that is anything that's new, but it's just a continuation of policies um, of systemic racism that is deeply embedded in all of the systems in which, um, you know, voting is not immune from that. And so um, I would say that it's just, uh, you know, uh, a continuation and that's why it requires, uh, you know, folks like Aklima and Jonathan to continuously do doing the work that they do um, by people and everyday people in the community are equally as important um, to make their voices heard and to continue to hold folks accountable. You know, lawmakers should be doing things that are expanding voting options for their voters and their constituents instead of engaging in um, behavior and, you know, policy legislating on lies, you know, that's essentially what we see happening here in Arizona and across the nation, trying to legislate um, based on uh, things that have no basis in reality. And so, um, you know, that's, you know, I'll just say that it's a continuation. It's something that is not, unfortunately, gonna go away magically by some, um, you know, by HR1 or HR4, you know, it's things that are gonna have to continuously be, uh, we're gonna have to hold folks to account um, and, you know, I think it's just a pillar of one of the things, it's an example of how fragile our democracy is. Um, and, um, you know, it, it highlights the hallmarks that our democracy is not perfect, it never has been, and it's not self-executing. Um, and so the imperfect nature of our democracy and the inability of our democracy to exist without our constantly, um, our constant input, you know, requires us to continuously and fervently do the work to ensure that we put its feet to the fire. And that's, I think, what Aklima and Jonathan and I hopefully are trying to do with the work that we do. Well, I just want to thank all three of you so much, Rosemary, Aklima, and Jonathan, both for joining us today and also the work that you do do um, day in and day out. It's so important and we're so lucky to have you with us to talk about it a little bit today. Um, I want to remind folks to join us at 1230 uh, for our next panel, Antitrust, Privacy, Big Tech, and Democracy. Um, and if you'd like, keep the conversation going in Whova. We, we didn't get to all the questions, um, but we'll try and do our best to engage 
uh, with folks. If you, you have lingering questions and thoughts, um, and we'll jump in there and see what we can do. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you to the three of you and uh, look forward to seeing everybody at 1230. Have a great day.